So today I'm going to talk about WebRTC fuzzing, WebRTC security fuzzing, and more. I'm going to start off by talking about some of the bad things that attackers are doing with video conferencing. And then I'm going to talk about how these attacks work from a technical perspective. Finally, I'm going to talk about how you can reduce the likelihood of security problems when integrating LibWebRTC. So I'm Natalie Silvanovich, and I'm a member of a team called Project Zero at Google. The mission of Project Zero is to make zero day hard. The goal of our team is to reduce the number of zero day vulnerabilities available to attackers in the wild. We do this from a user focused perspective, which means that we look at all software, not just Google software. And the bulk of our work involves looking at various pieces of software and trying to find vulnerabilities so that they can be fixed and they're no longer available to attackers. We also publish a lot of research about vulnerabilities because we're trying to emulate a real attack team and close the gap between the information that attackers have access to and the information that defenders have access to. So one zero day we found really interesting was this zero day that was found in WhatsApp in May. It was used by a bunch of totalitarian governments to um, attack journalists, activists, and academics who were pro-democracy. And this was a very harmful exploit they used. Uh, it was what we call a zero-click or interactionless exploit, which means that these attackers pretty much just had to put a phone number into their tool, and they would immediately get access to um, all the WhatsApp messages on that person's device. And um, yeah, I'm not sure what he was doing with my slides, but whatever. Um, <laughs> and um, what was more interesting is uh, how that worked technically. So there were two bugs in WhatsApp that allowed this to happen. Number one, there was a bug in their video conferencing signaling. Uh, they use PJSIP, which is similar to WebRTC in that you do signaling and then you do peer-to-peer -peer protocols for your audio and video streams. And um, there was a bug in their signaling where you could move these peer-to-peer -peer protocols so that they were processed before the person who got the incoming call picked up the call. So this made a bug that was otherwise would require someone to pick up the call to be uh, interactionless. And then there was a memory corruption bug in one of their peer-to-peer -peer protocols, and that was what it was exploited to get code execution. And you might think that this is a one-time thing, but it's not. This is the price list from a company called Zerodium. And what Zerodium will do is basically buy vulnerabilities from whoever and sell them to whoever. So um, anyone can submit their vulnerabilities. And you can see, for example, that WhatsApp vulnerability would have gone for $1.5 million on Zerodium. So you can just imagine what someone might be doing with a vulnerability that they paid $1.5 million for. But something interesting here is there are some interesting targets. For example, there is Facebook Messenger, there is Signal, there is Chrome, there is Safari, and there is Android remote vulnerabilities in general. And what do these all have in common? Well, they use LibWebRTC. So I think it's fairly likely that, like WhatsApp, attackers are using WebRTC to attack some of these very valuable targets. Um, so what I wanted to find out is whether WebRTC had a similar bugs to that WhatsApp bug. Um, does it contain them? How many and what type? And to start off, I looked at the information available and this was WebRTC's security page at the time. I see a couple people laughing. Um, security people find this funny because there's a tendency to have an inverse relationship between how secure someone thinks they are and how secure they actually are. But the reality of this also meant that there was just uh, no information on this subject, so I wanted to find out more about it. So there's kind of two ways attackers and defenders alike find security bugs. One is looking at the source, um, which works sometimes, but for something like WebRTC, there really is a lot of source. Um, so I did what was called fuzzing. 
And fuzzing is basically sending random data to your application and seeing if it crashes. Think of like the worst piece of software you have ever written. Imagine what would happen if you started mashing the keyboard or putting random input in. It would crash, of course. And this is the idea behind fuzzing. If you put in enough random data, eventually you'll hit these cases that lead to crashes. And you might even hit like wild cases that you never thought of. And I fuzzed fuzz three things. Um, one was SDP. I picked that one just because that, if there's ever a bug in SDP, is fully remote because typically clients will exchange um, SDP before the user picks up the call. Um, and then I also looked at RTP and RTCP just because they have a large amount of code and I thought it was very likely they would have vulns in them. So how do you fuzz? Well, if you're a developer, I'd recommend using libfuzzer. And I won't go into this too much, but if you find yourself in the situation where you are writing your own um, software that processes RTP, I would recommend you look this up and you implement some libfuzzer so that you can fuzz on a regular basis as a part of your build process. Um, but if you want a bit more control, a typical way to do this is to write a tool that will um, take your input and then fuzz it that way. And that's what I did. Um, so the general way that fuzzing will work is you start off, you need some input, and then you need a way to generate malformed ones. So basically what I did is I used Chrome to take um, RTP traces when I did different calls. And then there's a tool at Google we can use to do different types of mutations. So I did bit flipping. There's ones that will add different tokens. And then you um, can send it to your target, and it's a good idea to instrument it so that it's more likely to crash um, when you send a malformed input. So we typically compile with ASAN, and then once I ran this for a long time, I got a lot of crash logs with test cases. And then the next step, I uh, took these test cases, analyzed them, and then filed bugs, and they got fixed. Though, of course, a bad guy will start running exploits at this point as opposed to reporting them. So what were my results from this? I found seven vulnerabilities in RTP processing in WebRTC. And just so you know that WebRTC isn't unique, I also found one bug in PJSIP, which is WhatsApp, and four bugs in FaceTime. So I don't think this is you know, necessarily a lib WebRTC thing. It's just these and protocols are very, very complex and very bug prone. And this is an ongoing effort and bugs continue to be, to be reported in these protocols. So I want to give an example of the sort of bug we found. So I'm going to give everyone like 30 seconds, look at this code, and try and figure out where the bug is. Okay, everyone have an idea of a bug now? So did you all guess here? Um, probably not. Uh, this is actually a fairly unusual bug. The problem here is you have this codec header, which is just the header out of the packet. And then it gets this field, which is the pick ID, and then it tries to find it in this group of frames info. But what if it's not in there? Um, I actually didn't know this. I had to look up what standard map find did. And it turns out if it's not in there, it returns what's called standard end, which is actually a pointer to the end of the array of stuff in the map, which is basically a pointer to an empty slot in the heap. Um, so this makes this a uh, fairly um, bad vulnerability. It means if someone was trying to exploit it, they can just try and move the heap until they have what they want in that area, and then it'll call stuff on it. Um, but the reason I gave this example is I feel like uh, not very many people would notice that bug in the code. And in fact, I had to read the docs to understand it. So this is why you know, fuzzing is a good technique. You can find these things that you never would have thought of. So um, now that we know that RTP is full of bugs, and I think um, all implementations will always have bugs in them, what can you do to reduce the risk of RTP to your application? What can you do to prevent your app from being used by totalitarian regimes to squash democracy? Well, 
To start off, use WebRTC or an alternative like PJSIP. It sounds counterintuitive, but these are at least somewhat mature solutions that have some testing. I think if you try and do this yourself, you'll have even more bugs because it hasn't been tested as much. So it's best to stick with a mature solution. And if you don't listen to me, look up that libfuzzer thing and make sure you fuzz. Um, also, keep your WebRTC up to date. Um, there's always vulns being found in it, so it's important that when they're found, you update your version, or else um, you'll ju you're just giving free bugs to attackers. They don't even need to find one. And also, um, avoid branching. As soon as you branch, you have to independently apply every update as opposed to just plugging in the new binary. So I recommend just using the binary and watch the WebRTC discuss list for when there's vulnerabilities and update it. And also, you should reduce the attack surface. Try and uh, make the amount of libwebrtc that you're using as small as possible, so if there's bugs in certain components, they might not affect your application. Um, for example, um, for codecs, uh, limit it to the codecs you're actually using. So if you don't need H.264, don't compile with H.264, and then if there's a bug in there, it doesn't affect your application. Um, also, um, try to put RTP processing what I call behind the ring, or if it's not, if you're doing streaming, put it behind a click. The idea here is um, for that WhatsApp bug, they had to find a bug in signaling to be able to process peer-to-peer -peer protocols before um, they could reach the bug in peer-to-peer -peer protocols. But if you just allow this to happen before someone picks up the call, attackers don't even need a bug for that. Um, so, and this is important for two reasons. One reason is it's just not as good a bug if someone has to pick up the phone. It, you know, maybe the person's asleep or doesn't answer untrusted calls, so it's just not as useful to attackers. But the other thing is the way that video conferencing exploits tend to work. You need multiple tries, so the attacker might even call like 10 times before it works, and then when they get code execution, they'll delete those calls. But um, even if someone, a victim, picks up a call once, they're not going to pick up a call 10 times if it crashes their phone every time. Um, so that's why this is important. Um, so this is basically the state diagram of an incoming call on WebRTC. And the best place to uh, put your call block is before you process the answer, or, or, or before you process the offer. This means that um, the connection won't be set up until the person answers, and um, that will reduce the risk of processing RTP before the person picks the call up. So it's also important to think a lot about your signaling protocol. Um, one thing, it's not always clear in the WebRTC documentation. Sometimes it says things like start sending video as soon as possible to um, increase the transmission rate or that sort of thing but it's actually very important that you get callee consent before you start sending video from their camera. Even if the person on the other side can't see it, a hacker could um, change their client so that they could see it. So uh, never start sending video or audio uh, before the callee consents because there are, are a lot of bugs where people will call and then they can see stuff through the camera before the person picks up. Also, evaluate your signaling method from the perspective of a hacked client. You know, do a state diagram and make sure it makes sense. Um, some common problems we see is even if people have a correct consent flow, there's bugs that allow people to bypass it. Um, there's also issues they will, in some situations, send audio and video when the user is not aware. Or they'll have incorrect user notifications. You know, there'll be bugs where you, you'll start sending video, but the video icon doesn't show up on the screen, that sort of thing. And these are, can all be used by attackers to kind of spy on the user when they're not aware. And they also make it possible to use vulnerabilities in RTP. So in conclusion, uh, WebRTC is a high-risk library in terms of memory corruption vulnerabilities, and uh, RTP is a high-risk protocol. So you need to use it correctly to reduce your security risk. You should make sure to keep WebRTC up to date Make sure you put RTP processing behind the incoming call block or a click if you're streaming. Uh, minimize the supported codecs and make sure you test your signaling adequately. Um, so that's it. Thanks a lot.